So it's one thing to know and believe that God is working in the world, but it's another thing entirely to believe that God is working in your own personal life. And so the question I want to start with tonight, and, and, and you don't have to answer out loud or raise your hand or anything, but just do you believe that God is working, that God is showing up in your life, in the circumstances of your life, in your prayers, when you pray that God is answering those prayers, that God is working and he's moving in your life and directing your life in such a way so that you become more like Christ? Do you believe that God is working? Hopefully many of you say, yes, I've, I've, seen, I've seen him work, I've experienced his work, or I've seen the evidence of his work, but some may still struggle with that, and there's lots of reasons, even those who have experienced it before might be struggling now, and, and, and maybe it's unanswered prayer. You feel like your prayer hasn't been answered. Maybe you're going through personal suffering and personal difficulty. Maybe you, you, you feel that there's really no visible evidence. I, I don't see any evidence that, the, that God is working in, in my life. You're comparing with others. You're just like, well, I see God working in that person's life in this way, but I don't see it in my life. Or you might just find yourself in a season where you're just kind of maybe spiritually complacent. And so you're just not sure where God is working. And what I want to do, I want to encourage you tonight to remember that the Bible is very clear. God is always working in our lives. He is always working in our lives. He is always doing something. And one of the greatest prayers that you can pray moment by moment, day by day, is just simply asking God, God, what are you up to in this moment? What are you working? What do you, show, what do you want to show me right here in this moment? Because he is always at work. And he is at work taking your life in a certain direction. And so our anchor that holds all of this together as we turn our attention to 1 John is this, is that he's going to show us that God works in me and that changes my view to victory. That when, when I know that God is working in me, it changes my perspective. That I no longer just see the horizontal perspective of life, but I see the vertical perspective. And I no longer see that, that life is coming against me, but I see that my Jesus has overcome all things. And that through him and in him and by him, I am an overcomer as well. And so the, the Bible is very clear. God is working in your life. So before we turn our attention to verses in 1 John chapter 5, let me just remind you of how emphatic the Bible states this. The Apostle Paul states it in two places in Philippians chapter, uh, in Philippians chapter 1 and chapter 2. He says, I am sure of this. <clears throat> Whenever the Apostle Paul is sure of something, he is sure. I mean, he, you can take it and you can believe with all of your heart that it, what he's about to say is the absolute truth. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's that victory that is going to be yours. You're going to experience at the day of Jesus Christ when he returns, descends out of heaven and raptures his church, the day of Christ, his second coming after so many other things are going to happen. That, that day we are going to experience this victory and God is at work moving our lives in that direction. And so Philippians chapter two, Paul says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So God is working in your life, and as he works, we work out. And so the, the image I love that, that I think Paul is painting here is that God is working things deeply into my heart, and then I work out and, and begin to live those things out into my everyday life. And that's what, what we're going to see here today as we look, turn our attention to 1 John. Now I just want to, I just want to ask you, if you'll receive what John says through these writings tonight, if you'll receive it fully, I, I, can, I promise you, you're going to leave here more encouraged than when you came. Because these are some amazing verses, amazing promises that John wrote to God's people. And if you will receive everything that it says, and if you will walk out here and say, I believe everything that we read tonight, you will walk out encouraged with confidence, knowing that God is working in your life. So we're going to ask the question, how is God working in me? 
And there's four sides of faith that John gives us here. So the first one is it's a faith expressed through love. A faith expressed through love. So in 1 John chapter 5, we'll start in uh, verse 1 and go down to verse 3. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commands. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. The word love here, it shows up, this is faith being expressed through love. Love for God, love for others. And this word love, it's the agape love, the love of God, the unconditional love of God that he gives us, agape love. And it shows up five times in five verses that we are called to express our faith to love. And, and what John is telling us is that faith always leads to love for God and love, <clears throat> excuse me, to other people. And love always, here's the second thing he says, is love always results in obedience. And so how do we get to that place where our, our faith is expressed through love? What is John telling us that, that we need in order to get to this place where we can be encouraged that God is working in us and working this faith in us that gets worked out of us in love. Well, there's two things. It's right belief that leads to right behavior. So he, he starts off with first right belief. He says it right there in verse one. You believe that Jesus is the Christ and has been born of God. That right belief, that word believe there, that's the, the, in the original language, that's the same word that elsewhere in your Bible will translate faith. That if you have faith that Jesus is the Christ. And so that's where it starts. You gotta have that right belief. And the Christ, notice how it says, it doesn't say Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ. So it's important to see, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is his title. That's who he is. And so John is doing something, that, and he knows exactly what he's doing as a Jewish, uh, first century Jewish uh, man. He, there, there is a long history of this, of this idea of a Messiah and of a Christ and of the anointed one of God who is going to come and redeem Israel and the world and set things right, set things the way they are supposed to be. And, and, and I would encourage you to do maybe your own study throughout the entire Old Testament of all these, these allusions to this. It starts in Genesis 3.15, then it moves up into Abraham and the promise to him, and then it comes to David and the promise to him that there is a king coming, and this one will be the anointed one of God, and he will bring a new covenant, and God will put his, his spirit into the hearts of men. But it all starts... That Jesus is the Christ, the promised one, the anointed of God, the king that we have all been looking for. That's who Jesus is. And so the right belief is that Jesus is the son of God who was sent by the father to die for the sins of the world and to pay for the sins of humanity. That now by believing in him, you have a new identity. You've been transferred from, your, from death to life in Jesus by right belief in who he is. But that right belief doesn't just stay in my own heart. Right belief leads to right behavior. And that's where we get to next. Well, first, let me read first, because uh, John alludes to this over in his gospel too. The same writer wrote the gospel of John as wrote First John. And he tells us in John chapter one, verses 12 and 13, he says, all who did receive him, who believed in his name, you see the idea that faith in the name of Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. That is your right. You have a birthright. We have no other rights in Christ other than a birthright that we are his children. Now there's a lot of things that come with that. A lot of good and a lot of promises and the promise of God's work and the promise of God's presence. Verse 13, we, we who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but you were born of God. But then, so he says, we gotta have this right belief that leads to this right behavior. What's the right behavior? It's two things, loving people and obeying what God says. It's very, very simple, but yet at the same time, it's a huge calling. This means because we're commanded to love, and love has is, is gotten a little skewed in our culture today, where we tend to think about love only from an emotional standpoint, and it's something that you feel. But for John here, love is not, it's not an emotion that you feel. It's a moral decision that you make to seek the good of another person over your own good. 
That's what love is, according to the Bible, that you love this person. So love for God, it's not an emotional experience so much as it is a moral commitment then to also keep the commandments of Jesus. And I love how he says, he just sort of adds this on, that we keep the commands of God and they're not burdensome. You understand, when I was a student pastor, I would ask students all the time, hey, you know, what is preventing you from giving your life to Jesus? And they're like, man, I just want to have some fun in life before I get to worry about that. And, and that just told me immediately, like, man, you don't understand who Jesus is. He's not a burden. He, in fact, he lifts the burden off of your life and puts the easy yoke of who he is upon your life and gives you a rest that you can't find anywhere else obeying him, God, the reason God gives us commands is because God knows what is best for us. And so when we obey those, we are living out the best that God wants for us by obeying his commands, and they are not burdensome. And so we're to love others as well, love for God. And, and so John equates this, that your love for God is expressed in your love for people, and your love for people expresses your love for God, that the two are the uh, two sides of the exact same coin. But then Jesus, and so we think, well, yeah, it's easy to love people that I get along with, but Jesus took it to another level. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. As followers of Jesus, we are not just encouraged to love our enemies. We're not just sort of, hey, if it went on a good day, try to do it. We're not just encouraged to do that. We're commanded to do that. We are commanded to love those who are different from us, who, who love those. You're commanded to love those who, when you see them, it drives you crazy. You're commanded. He doesn't give us any room. And the Apostle Paul over in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, he says, go first in honoring others. Outdo one another in honoring each other. Go first. But you might say, yeah, but they don't deserve honor. The Apostle Paul didn't put that condition on it. He didn't say, when they deserve it, make sure you honor them. He said, no, no, you go first in honoring others. We love not only those whom we get along with, but we love even our enemies, even those who persecute us, and we pray for them. It's a faith that is expressed by love. The second side of, the, uh, of faith that John wants to see that we, when God is working in us, what begins to happen in us is that we have a faith to overcome the world around us. A faith to overcome the world. We talked earlier in this, in this series over when we went through 1 John chapter 2, what the world is. And, and the way I like to de describe and define the world, it is the collective flesh of all individuals coming together and creating a system that is opposed to God and his people. And so we have the strength and the faith then to overcome that world. Here's what John says in verses four and five. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Do you lie? He's just straightforward and that simple. And that's true for every single one who believes that Jesus is the Christ. And this is the victory that has, uh, that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Everyone who's been born of God is able to keep the commands of God, and you're able to overcome the world more so than you were ever able to do. Outside of Christ, there is no overcoming the world. Outside of Christ, before Christ, there is only being absorbed by the world. But once you come to Jesus, friends, you have a, a, a spiritual power in you that was not available to you beforehand. You have a spiritual life in you. You are now alive. You're no longer dead. You're alive in Christ. And so you have this spiritual power by your faith, as he says here. What's the victory? It's our faith. Our faith is what moves us and grabs hold of this victory that we have in Jesus. And so the world, this collected flesh, we overcome we don't just give in, we don't just, we don't bow down and just go along and say, well, this is what I'm going to do. No, we overcome. Now, we still express it through love, but we overcome the world. Jesus said it in John 16, he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation or trouble, but take heart, 
I have overcome the world. We overcome the world because Jesus overcame. We are overcomers and we are conquerors because Jesus is an overcomer and Jesus is a conqueror. And notice this is not a future reality. This is not a one day you will be an overcomer. This is a present reality that is fully available to you now in Christ Jesus. All of it is available to you. The fullness of God's kingdom is fully available to you right here, right now. It's not a future promise, it's a current promise. The only only condition is are you gonna trust and reach out and take hold of what God wants to put into your life? Are you gonna trust that you can have the overcoming power of Jesus? But what does that mean? Let me kind of give you an illustration. When we went on our, our trip to the Northern Rockies here just a few weeks ago, there were some trails that we had to go up to go see some of the things that we want to see. And there were some big hills and walking a long way. And our daughter, Eva, she can walk a little bit, but then she just gets tired and, and just kind of gives out. And so there was a lot of those, guess who gets to carry her? Dad does. And I'm talking like uphill, both ways. But regardless of all that, so I would throw her on my back and I would be like, you ready? I'm ready. Well, let's go. I hope I'm ready. And I was able, I, what I was found is I was able to walk up those hills. I carried her up an entire flight of steps that, I mean, and we're at elevation. And I was just like, man, this is great to be able to do all this. Like, I don't know how I'm able to do this, but then it, it kind of occurred to me. I've been running for almost the past two years. I get up at, in, in early morning. Nobody else in my family is awake except maybe Shay at times. And I run. Nobody else sees it. But it, that is what gave me the strength. And, and here's my point. My point is not that I'm, I'm in incredible shape. That's not my point. Don't miss this. The point is this. Your ability to experience victory when you go out into the world only happens as you put in the time with Jesus that no one else sees. That's, that's how it happens. And that's what John is encouraging you to do, that you experience victory by being with Jesus. And the victory is yours. Now, l- let's just be clear. That victory doesn't mean that life is gonna be wonderful and rosy and perfect and gonna work out exactly the way I want it to and God's gonna make sure I have no obstacles and no storms. That's not the way we overcome the world. Remember, our Savior overcame the world by death. And sometimes we are called into that same direction. So, but we do have the faith to overcome fully available to us now. The third side of this work that God is doing in us is that we have the faith to believe the testimony of Jesus. That we are rock solid. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt who my Lord is. Because I have the testimony, not just of what God has done in me, but I have the testimony of what God has said about his very own son. And that is what John gives us here in verses six through 10. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, if the, uh, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. It's important where that is. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. So John's point here is that there is an over and abundant testimony and evidence to prove that Jesus is the Son of God who provides eternal life for all who believe in him. And so let's kind of break this down of what this this testimony is. So he mentions this idea of the water and the blood. And I can remember years ago when I read 1 John for the first time. I remember it it, it was one of the first books of the Bible that I read. And I got to this place and I was like, well, what does that mean? Testify by the water and the blood. And here's, here's what it means. It's, it's amazing what John does here in such a few words. He basically, he bookends the life of Jesus. So first, when did Jesus' ministry officially go public? When he was baptized. When he was baptized, that's the water. When John sees him and he baptizes him and he says, behold, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. 
When does that come to fruition in, 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 uh, in his earthly life? At the cross where his blood was shed. And so John's saying, look, you can know that he is, because at his baptism, the father testified over him. This is my son, in him I am well pleased. Listen to him and follow him. At his death on the cross, he, bought the, he paid the price for our sins, and he shed his blood. The water and the blood testify. But then he just sort of puts an overarching stamp over it and says, oh, by the way, also, the spirit of truth being the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God himself testifies with the water and the blood. You can and take it to the bank beyond a shadow of a doubt. This man, Jesus Christ, was the Christ, the anointed one of God, who takes away the sins of the world. For all who believe in him, the water and the blood. The water and the blood there, the, the, these bookends. And, and he's, what he's doing is he's dealing with this, this teaching, this false teaching that is going on in the church that he is writing to that basically said, Jesus, he just seemed like a human being. But he wasn't really, he was really a spirit, but he just seemed like a human being. And he's saying, no, no, it, it testifies clearly. Like he was, because he was a man, fully man, fully God, fully man, he was baptized. Because he was fully man, fully God, fully man, he died bodily. Though He did both of those. And that's why he opens his whole letter. When you go back to the beginning of it, uh, John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life. And so he's saying, look, you believe my testimony, but there's even a stronger testimony, and that's the testimony of God, that God has put his mark on Jesus and given us everything. And I think John, being a Jewish person also, he had Deuteronomy 19.15 here in mind where it says, a matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so John says, I got two, now I got three. It's established. This is the reality. And this testimony is not a human creation. It's a divine testimony of God. And it's not just an intellectual belief. This is what I love. It, it, no, remember I told you it's important where it's located? It's in himself. Those who believe that Jesus is the Christ, this testimony is inside us. What does that mean? So you go over to Romans. And there Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit of God lives in our spirit and is witnessing and, and giving testimony to us that we are the children of God. That he is confirming that almost over and over and over in your own spirit that you are a child of God. You are loved by God. God is working. God is present. God is with you. God is for you. Over and over and over again, the Holy Spirit is testifying to your spirit, the deepest part of who you are, that you are a child of God. And the only other option then is to reject it. And John says clearly, if you do that, you're calling God a liar. So one commentator says like this, he says, there is no room for ignorance or misconception. To reject the witness is to deny the truthfulness of God. He has spoken and acted deliberately with absolute clearness. The testimony has been born. The things were not done in a corner. The witness must therefore either be accepted or rejected. It cannot be ignored or explained away. You can't just ignore it and you can't explain Jesus away. You either have to receive him or you're going to reject him. There is no middle ground. And friends, Jesus himself will not let you live in any kind of middle ground with him. He was very clear about who he was. He believed himself to be the Christ, the anointed one, the son of the living God. Let me just give you a few examples of how we know that. Jesus received worship as God. When people worshiped him, he didn't stop them. Angels, they stop people from worshiping them. Jesus received it. Why? Because he is God. He claimed that he and the Father were one, which is, which is a claim that he is God. And we know that by what they did next is they picked up stones and were gonna stone him. Because they, he was claiming equality with God. Jesus used the phrase in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say I existed. He said, I am. And what he did there is he invoked the divine covenant name of God over in Exodus 3 when, when Moses asked God, God, who should I say sent me? And God says, I am who I am. Jesus says he is the same. 
So Jesus clearly says he clearly believed and clearly lived and taught that his death would pay for the sins of people. Why? Because he is the Christ, the anointed one of God. So friends, the testimony of the Bible is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly that God's testimony is that Jesus is the Christ. The question then is, do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe personally that Jesus is not the Christ, the Messiah, but that he's your Christ, your Messiah, your Savior? Do you believe? Have you ever put your faith and trust in Jesus and prayed and said, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. Thank you for paying for my sins on the cross. And I want you to be my Savior. And I want you to come and live inside my life. And I want to follow you all the days of my life. Have you ever had where you made the decision to follow Jesus? Friends, that's what John says is needed and necessary and required for God to work in your life. Believe. Do you believe? Once you do, there's the fourth side of this work that God does in our life, and it's faith in God's guarantee of life. God guarantees us eternal life. So it says in verses 11 through 12, this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. So you first you see that God gave us eternal life. Eternal life, it's a gift. We don't earn it. We don't do anything to try to keep it once it's been given to us. The only thing you know that you can do with a gift is you can receive it or you reject it. But once you receive it, you don't have to earn, you don't have to keep, like keep up with it to try to keep it. No, it's been given to you. God fully gives you eternal life. And once he gives it, it is yours and it is guaranteed by God. And I love that. It's not guaranteed by me. It's not guaranteed by my ability. It's not guaranteed by my ability to even keep his commandments. It's guaranteed by him that he is the one who stamps my life and says, you now have eternal life. This is why Acts 4.12 says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name other than the name of Jesus. If you have the Son, you have life. And it's not life in the future. This is not life. Life in abundance when I get to heaven. I, John 10.10, 10, what did Jesus say? I've come to give life and life in abundance. But that's not, that's not heavenly life only. Yes, it, that is. But it's now. He was very clear, it is now. When you read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and he describes in the Sermon on the Mount, life in the kingdom, it's available, all those things are available to us right now. One of my favorite writers and kind of a, a spiritual mentor to me, even though all I have ever done is read his books, is Dallas Willard, and here's what he said. So the kingdom of God is God in action. It's where what he wants is done. The gospel of Jesus is that life in the kingdom is available to us right now. We can experience the kingdom and live in it by placing our confidence in Jesus for everything and by being his constant students precisely because we have confidence in him. I love that picture. Like, there's not a whole lot of stuff that you got to do. You just need him. You just need him. So what does it mean to have the son? It means you trust him for your life. And when you trust someone, you do what they say. So kind of let's put it in a, in a picture here. You go to the doctor and you tell the doctor, the doctor says, hey, look, I, I need you to trust me. Do you trust me? And you say, yes, doc, absolutely. I trust you. I trust what you're going to say and, I'm, I, and I trust what you're going to tell me to do. So yeah, I trust you. And the doctor says, well, look, your health is not great. And the only thing that you can do to cure it is you got to give up Cajun food. Give it all up. And you, you can talk with like, like, which, like, you know, which ones? All of them. You got to get rid of them all. You can't, you can't eat any of them. Like not even, no, you can't even taste them. Mm -mm. You can't do it. If you do, if you keep living like this, if you keep eating that cage of food, you're going to die. And then you walk out, one of two things can happen. You can do it or you cannot. If you don't, one of two things is true. Either you love Cajun food more than life, which is possible, or you don't trust what the doctor has said. 
That's what we're getting at here. If you trust Jesus, we do what he says. If we trust him for our life, if we trust him for our eternal life, then we trust him in this life as well. And so we do what he says. We love our enemies and we pray for him. I don't want to do that. I, 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 there's oftentimes when he says, love your enemies and pray for them. There's not one of us who said, yes, I'm right on that. I don't, sometimes we don't want to do that. But he didn't say to do it when you want to. He just simply said, this is what we need to do. This is what you need to do. This is the command that I give you. And we follow the commands of Jesus because here's the reality that I've come to terms with. Jesus simply knows more than I do about what my life needs. He just simply does. And so when I read his commands, like love your enemies and pray for them, for me, that's like, that doesn't make any sense. But for him, he knows something that I don't know. And he knows that I need for my own health, for my own love, my own joy, my own peace in my life, that I need to not hate my enemies, but love my enemies. So how do we, how should I respond then to God's work in my life? First, three, just three quick applications that we can take from this. First, embrace your identity in Jesus. Now, I'm not going to re-preach Bo's entire sermon. I would encourage you to go back and listen to this past Sunday where he covered identity in Christ. I just want to say a couple of things about it. The Bible is clear that our real problems in life are not the circumstances that are around us. Are not even sometimes the decisions that we make. Those are not our real problems. The real problems that we have is when we try to build an identity on anything other than Jesus. If your identity is on anything other than Jesus, two things are in danger of happening. When you're successful, you're going to be prideful. When you fail, you're going to be completely despondent. If you build your life on anything other than Jesus. So let me give you a couple of just quick examples. If work is your identity, when you do a great job, man, you feel prideful. You walk around like oh, chest puffed out, like I'm advancing, I'm, I'm a big shot, I'm a big deal around here. Well, when you fail, it is complete and utter despondency and life is over. If I don't have that job, what's the point? Parent identity. If your identity is in those children, we love them, we care for them, but they're not our identity. But if you find yourself in that place, when your kids are great, you're gonna be prideful. Look at what I have done. When your kids are not, despondent. What did I do wrong? But when Jesus is your identity, success, when things go well, Jesus, I praise you for being good to me. When you fail, when things don't go the way you want, Jesus, I trust you through this difficulty. Amen. You're rock solid. That's why it's so important that you build your life upon Jesus and nothing else. Secondly, stand firm in your belief in Jesus. Stand firm and do not be moved. You've got the testimony of God inside of you of who Jesus is for you. And we must stand upon that and stand solidly and stand firmly. A couple of things that I would encourage you to do. The, one of the ways that you get, do this is you get rooted in the scripture. You've got to open your Bible every single day, friends. You've got to read it every single day. There's going to need to be times where you study it. There needs to be times where you meditate on it. You need to memorize it. Scripture is the guide that shows us how to live. Scripture is where we learn the commands of Jesus that he wants in our lives for, for our own good. And so you've got to open your Bible. And that's where you become like Psalm chapter 1 talks about. You're like a tree planted by streams of water. So Psalm chapter 1 verses 1 through 3, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight, meaning our joy, is in the law of the Lord. That's your Bible. The law of the Lord, that's your Bible. And, his, and on his law, he meditates day and night. And what's the result? He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. You gotta be rooted in scripture to stand firm in Jesus. A second aspect of standing firm in Jesus, though, is you also need community. You can't stand firm in Jesus all by yourself. You can be a follower, you can be a Christian, you can be saved and not be in community. But friends, you can't grow and you can't stand firm if you try to do, follow Jesus all alone. 
It's not designed, we're never designed. God never designed us to try to follow Jesus and be the lone ranger in doing it. It has always been designed to be in community. So surround yourself with people who support you, who encourage you, who will challenge you, who will pray for you, who will build you up. Be a part of a small group. Some of you, you you know, you might have a family, and that's great. That's awesome. Family is one of the building blocks of, of life that God gave to us. But he also said that's not all that you need. You also need your church. You also need your people of your church, people that you can um, um, share life with and people that can build you up. And then the third aspect of standing firm is prayer. Prayer. And prayer is not only asking God for things. There is a place for that. Don't get me wrong. God tells us that we can and we should do that. But it's not just about that. The prayer that will help us stand firm in Christ is the prayer of being, just simply being with Jesus in an honest way. Consistent prayer is needed Consistent prayer throughout your day, moment by moment sometimes prayers, where you're just consistently aware that he is with you. And then the last, the last uh, way that we need to apply God's work in us is simply this, share the good news whenever you can, wherever you can, with whomever you can. Your identity is in Christ. And he made it clear in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that part of our identity is that we are witnesses. Witness is a verb. It's something that we do. But Jesus, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he used it as a noun. It's who we are. We are witnesses. It's a part of, part of us. And so we share. We share by our lives. We share by how we live. We share by expressing our, our faith through love, loving others, even loving our enemies and praying for them. And so that's, those are ways that we consistently share. We share with our life, but we also speak the words of the gospel when necessary. We call others to the gospel. We call others like Paul does in first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Be reconciled to God. We implore you to be reconciled to God. And you, we do that with words. But it's important to remember, you're a witness. You're not a salesperson. It's not your job to close the deal. Don't, don't, let, don't let Satan whisper that lie into your life and put that pressure on you of like, oh, I'm going to mess this up. I can't get this right. If I don't get them across the line, I, I've, I've messed it all up. Our job is not to get them across the line. The way I like to say it, it's, it's not our job to get them to say yes, but it is our job to give them an opportunity to say yes. That's what we are to do. John Mark Comer says, some will be attracted to the gospel, others will be repulsed. And that's okay. We're not responsible for outcomes any more than a witness is responsible for the ruling in a trial. We are witnesses. Saying yes is between the person and God. So God is working. Do you trust his work? That's simply where I want to leave the question. Do you trust his work? I want to kind of give you an image to take with you to kind of think about this. Have you ever, how many of you have ever been on a sky bridge? Like, raise your hand. You ever been on what they call a sky bridge? Okay, so what these things are is Grand Canyon has one, and there was one where we went on our trip. They build these, what they call sky bridges, and they're sort of half circles out over a deep, deep canyon. And they're made of sort of a transparent plexiglass plastic. So you walk out, and you can see straight down uh, here, here's a picture. That's, that's Elise, my daughter Elise, standing on that thing. And that's, I don't know, that's a river at the bottom. There's Weller standing at the bottom of the thing. And that's what it looks like. And you can see straight down. And so the first time I, I got up to it, you know, Elise, she's bold. She just, she, whoo, gone. Like, no hesitation whatsoever. But I'm telling y'all, it's a little disturbing to stand at that and to look and to think, I can put my foot out here and I'm not going all the way down. So I did, I, I put my foot out and I was like, no, this is, I began to look at like, man, this thing, it was very, very well built. So I got on and began to walk, had a great time. It was having a great time until I was standing next to a complete stranger. I don't know this guy. I don't, I, and, and then I didn't, I never saw him again. I don't know where he came from. But here's what he said. We're standing there and I'm looking down at the gorge and he says, you realize that we're standing on a bridge that was engineered and built by the lowest bidder. <laughs> and I turned, I was like, 
Well, not till you said it. <laughs> no. And then he was gone. I never saw him again. I don't know what the point of that was. And it occurred to, but it, it occurred to me in that moment. It occurred to me. I didn't just trust what I could see. I also trusted, without even realizing it, I trusted the work of the men who had put that thing up. Amen. Here's the point. Sometimes you can see the work of God and you can trust that work of God. But other times, friends, what, it's not available to be seen. And when you can't necessarily see the evidence of God's work, we can still trust his hand and trust his heart. Amen. We can still trust him because we have the testimony of Jesus Christ who came and paid for the sins of the world. Do you trust his work? I pray that you trust him. Let's pray. Father, you're so good to us. And your word, again, just encourages us so much. Father, I pray we would all trust. God, that any of us that don't, you show us clearly where we need to make a decision, make a change, to trust you. Lord, we need, we need faith to do so. So, Father, continue to increase our faith so that we might trust in you. And thank you for Jesus and for sending him, the Christ, who died to pay for our sins. We pray in his holy name. Amen.